Good afternoon and welcome back to this, the third scientific session in our Science Outlook Conference 2021 for AFPE. If you don't know me by now, I'm Dr Elizabeth McGowan and I'm one of the three science directors in AFPE. So this morning we've already had a scientific session focusing on the interactions between animal and human health. And just before this session, just after lunch there, we also had a session focusing on the modelling and managing of our ecosystems to drive sustainability. So we're delighted that you know, over 400 of our colleagues, customers, partners and friends have been able to join us throughout the day for these sessions, which very much align with our three main strategic science themes of leading improvements in the agri-food industry, enhancing the natural and marine environment, and protecting animal, plant, and human health. So as I said, this morning we had Professor Miles Carroll, as well as Dr. David McCleary and, and Ken Lemon, who really gave us a, the scare of our lives around the amount of threats out there that with regards to microbiology and viruses that could well affect us. But equally, they very much gave us the assurance that um, there's a significant surveillance and diagnostic advances in science to protect us from those threats. Just before lunch there, then Professor Yao Ferraro and our own Dr Heather Moore and Dr Donna Hadoudi took us through a, a range of very complex modelling um, tools which are currently enabling our understanding of the pressures on the environment and how interventions can improve environmental outcomes for our ecosystems. So there's a big focus on, on water quality right through from inland waterways out to the coasts. And that area of work, of course, very much aligns with enhancing the natural and marine environments. So this being the third session of the, the conference, we will now look at the role of plants and their production in our food system. And of course, that aligns very closely with our agenda on leading improvements in the agri-food industry. The conference today is complemented by our recently relaunched Science Impacts booklet for 2021, and that's available on our website. So if you haven't already looked, do have a look through the, the Science Impact booklet because it's full of interesting articles delivered in partnership with a range of funders and universities and industry that have very much brought together um, scientific advances for that leading, protecting and enhancing agendas. But back to this session, and I'm delighted to have Mr. Martin McHendry, who's the Director of the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise with us today. And Martin and I have been working very closely over the past 18 months to 24 months on, on really building stronger relationships between AFBI and CAFRI. And indeed, we now have a strong framework in place to really go forward and, and collectively as two organisations to deliver enhanced outputs for DERA and ultimately the wider agricultural industry in Northern Ireland. So Martin, I'm really delighted to have you with us thank today you. to chair this session and uh, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, and a warm welcome to everyone out there for the final session uh, this afternoon. Um, especially a warm welcome to those who are joining us for the first time today. Uh, and I hope that you enjoy uh, this session. Um, and with the lineup of speakers, it really does uh, promise to be uh, a thoroughly interesting uh, and fascinating session. So, the, t the title of the session, The Role of Plants and Their Production in Our Food Systems, uh, is very apt at this time. Um, and I'll now move to introduce our first speaker, who's Professor Fiona Duhan. Uh, and Professor Duhan has a BSc in Industrial Microbiology from UCD and a PhD from John Inns Centre uh, in Harper Adams Agricultural College. After a postdoctoral position in John Inns Centre, she moved to UCD, where she joined the faculty as a plant pathologist. Her researching and teaching focuses on plant biotechnology and plant pathology, with an emphasis on increasing the resilience of food crops and their adaptability to current and future climatic conditions. And with that introduction, over to you, Professor Duhan. And the title of the presentation is Our Future Food System, The Renewed Role for Plants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for that introduction. And thanks to Elizabeth and to AFBI for the opportunity to chat to you this afternoon. So I come to you today from a windy Donegal. 
So I want to talk a bit about the role, the renewed role of plants in our agri-food systems. And I'm going to start with the take home message. OK, so the first take home message is, as most people are aware, there is a growing and renewed focus on crops at the dietary level and in terms of the enhancing the sustainability of our farm systems. So we're all aware there's a global dietary shift. The growth areas we see are in vegetarian, vegan diets, but also in flexitarian diets where one day someone wants to eat a vegetable based diet and the next day a meat diet. And of course, we see the growth of hybrid products such as oat dairy products, etc. And just to th think, where is the primary source of plant based calories coming from? Well, you have the cereals uh, in Ireland, for example, we grow a lot of oats and barley. Uh, some wheat uh, in general around the world, of course, wheat, uh, maize and rice are three of the main sources of human calories. Um, there's a renewed interest in Europe in producing legumes. We import a lot of legumes for animal feed, of course, on the island of Ireland. Um, and of course, we have vegetables, a very important source, and fruit and nuts. Now, I make a bit of an apology here at the start. I'm a cereal scientist. I'm a crop scientist. So I'm a bit biased in that direction as I talk, just to call that out. So the increased consumption of these plant-based products means we have more demand for crops, okay? But there's, there's a downside to this at the moment, okay? And one of the downsides is that we don't score very high on the island of Ireland in terms of the security of our plant-based food systems for food and for animal feed, okay? We're importers. And Based on the way agriculture has evolved since the Green Revolution, we have optimized a lot of our crop production systems, most of our crop production systems for high input production systems. So we're putting on a lot of synthetic chemicals and we're growing a very narrow range of crops. So that's a bit of a negative. Crop and horticultural production, as I alluded to, is low on the island of Ireland. And just to look at Northern Ireland in particular, if you look here, and this is the DERA figures from 2019, you see that horticulture accounts for 5%, crops 3%. So it's a very small part of the whole crop production system if you um, leave grass aside, obviously, for um, pasture. And then if you look at in terms of cereals and potatoes, just to dive into those figures a little bit, uh, you'll see that we have exports of about 150 million, imports of 220 million. So that's a minus 71 million trade balance. So we could do better in terms of food security on the island of Ireland, north of the border, and the same situation exists south of the border. I said we've optimized many of our crop production systems for high inputs and just looking at the pesticide usage in the United Kingdom and in Ireland, it's relatively high uh, in relation to the agricultural land use. And we are facing huge changes coming down the line. Uh, in, the, in the European Union, we obviously have the removal of a lot of the pesticides we use for crop production uh, and glyphosate is always getting a reprieve. It has a reprieve now for five years again, but Luxembourg will be the first country to ban the use of glyphosate. So by the end of last year, glyphosate was totally banned. So that's a big move. And I don't think that we're going to have chemicals such as glyphosate for much longer. So we have to really rethink how are we going to control our weeds. And in terms of pest controls, we use a lot of chemicals. And this is from a Chagas in the Republic of Ireland report on pest controls and looking at how are we going to achieve the requirements under the EU Green Deal uh, on the island of Ireland. And really, we have to reinvent and relook at the integrated management of our pest systems. So using different approaches, resistant varieties, biological inputs, intercropping, regenerative agriculture. We really need to relook at the whole system. So all oh, that's a wee bit of a negative story. Let's turn around now and actually be positive. There's always an opportunity when you meet a challenge. And so as Einstein said, in the middle, middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Okay, and there's an opportunity here in the island of Ireland. Firstly, the technology in crop science and in agronomy is now at a stage that we really have the capacity to relatively rapidly over the next, I would say, five year window 
move to enhance the sustainability of our land use, to displace some of our imports or replace them with our own indigenous proteins, and at the same time, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, maybe we should take a look at France. We don't often look at France in a positive light, but let's look at France in a positive light today in the agricultural production systems. So in, on, in December, on De December the 1st, to be specific, the French Minister for Agriculture announced that they want to boost protein pr crop production uh, in France and replace imports. And they put definite figures behind that in terms of the percentage reduction by 2022 and every year thereafter. So that's a real target that they hope to achieve. And maybe we should follow that lead. In the Republic of Ireland, a report was released last year called Crops 2030, which looked at how what would be a strategic plan to deliver environmental and economic sustainability for the Irish crop center, crop sector, sorry. And it's really a very good but very a plan at the end of the crop. So we really need to innovate sustainability and reducing inputs and, re and enhancing the climate agenda at farm level. But we have to really take a systemic approach. We, as a plant pathologist, for example, in the past, I would very much look at developing new varieties of crops that are disease resistant. And I wasn't really looking at other aspects like what's the nutrition of the crop? What's the other attributes of the crop? And that's just at the field level. And I certainly wasn't looking beyond the farm gate. And so we have to change that. We have to take a systemic approach. We have to go from the health back to the soil and from the soil forward to the health. And there's a lot we could really do to enhance the nutritional value and to get higher value added products from crops. And just to focus on the nutrition, it's a good example. So it might come as a surprise to many, but nutrition is not a key factor in developing new varieties of crops. OK, so the primary goal in developing a new variety to, uh, is to have a high yielding variety under diverse environmental conditions and stresses. But we know, even in terms of poverty, that a number of nutritional interventions have been shown to improve uh, health and survival, and that includes crop breeding for improved nutritional content. And we also know that there is value to be added to products developed on the island of Ireland by looking to breeding to extract new compounds or develop crop products with new value added, nutritionally enhanced and superior uh, um, uh, ingredients within them. So there's great potential there and it's all about sustainability, but sometimes I think we forget that there's three angles to sustainability. Of course, we have the environmental sustainability that we're often quite aware of. So reducing greenhouse gases, pesticides and improving soil health. But we have to do that in an integrated farm model where we're looking at the economic sustainability of the farms and plants have a really important role to play in that and education in the area of crop science has a really important role to play in that. We need incentives to support change at farm level and we need to provide farmers with tools to evaluate sustain economic sustainability and we need to reward farmers for environmental good services. And we have to do this going down to the last point there, the social sustainability through communities of practice. You can't ask one farmer to change on his own. You have to have a community of practice where they all do it together and learn from each other. There's a huge social dimension, as everyone knows, to farming. And we have to look through the supply chain. And in this digital era, track and trace systems have a huge role to play as we do this in ensuring the provenance of our food systems, including our crop and plant production systems, and to enable farmers to make smart decisions about the inputs and the choices they make in terms of crop production at farm level. So I want to just switch then briefly and talk about, so I said there's opportunity. I also said earlier, there's the technology. So we're gonna hear a little bit more about that from Lisa and from Jonathan uh, later on. But I just want to touch, so we have the omics. We've done lots of work. These are scientific papers that we 
publish where we use this all this omic technology, genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics to figure out how to breed crops more efficiently, to identify genes, for example, that enhance crop disease resistance. So those tools are widely available now. There are phenomic tools, which Lisa will talk about later, analyzing phenotype in an automated fashion at field level. Jonathan will touch on gene editing. We have the tools now to edit genes and as with as much controversy that brings, it's here and we need to deal with this technology because there's, and in many ways it's an untraceable technology. So we really need to be on top of our game here with understanding uh, what it's about this technology, what the implications are for Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland. Everyone's very aware of the microbiome at, uh, in terms of human health. So your gut microbiome and how important it is. It's also extremely important at field level. It's very important in terms of farm health. And in many cases, a disease is just a microbiome out of sync. So there's a huge renewed focus on microbiome and developing biological inputs for agricultural systems. And I'll touch a little bit on that in a minute and track and trace technology. Just get want to mention one example there. So we have a project, Food Shield, which is an all island project involving North and South. And that is looking at tracking the provenance of oat-based systems from the field right through to products. So it's a very, it's a prototype project, scoping, a scoping exercise to see, can we do this? And it's looking very positive, the early stages here. So we really hope that this is the basis of a much bigger project. I'm going to focus on oats a minute because oats is a very nice example of a crop on the island of Ireland that has much better potential than, uh, uh, than exploited at the moment. It's a high quality indigenous product. It's an ideal low input crop. Okay, it needs, needs lower inputs. The health benefits are renowned. So you have the beta glucans, you have oils, you have vitamin E, etc. You have all sorts of products, food and non-food between it. There are scientific facts linking oat consumption and reduced risk of coronary heart disease, diabetes, cancers, stomach problems. And there are loads of potential to develop new products, including hybrid products. In the Republic of Ireland, we grew one variety of oats for over 30 years. Now that's branching out a bit, but we could go much further. The genetic diversity present in oat varieties means that there's a huge diversity of nutritional profiles that we could be exploiting for different products, targeting different uh, diseases in humans or targeting different product development. And we have one project recently funded on oats called Healthy Oats. It's a Welsh Republic of Ireland project. And uh, it's a very exciting project. It has several goals, seven goals to be specific. First of all, we're trying to enhance the diversity of varieties of oats we grow in the British Isles and in the Republic of Ireland, improve the disease resistance, improve the biological balance of farm soils, okay? Um, and in that, I would like to point out, it also includes looking at the microbiome, help move farms towards more carbon neutral production systems, produce safe oat products. So one of the things in the press from the oats perspective, obviously, are mycotoxin contamination of oats. And I'll come back to that in a minute. These are toxins you find in oats. We want to reduce the levels of those toxins and provide farmers and processors with the tools to reduce those and to produce nutritionally enhanced oat products and new oat products targeting specific communicable diseases or risk groups, at-risk groups. And that leads into something else, a new initiative launched recently, which is really exciting to see, uh, pioneered by Whites in the North and AFBI and Chagas in the Republic of Ireland. It's a forum called Oats Ireland, which really will bring together the oat community on the island of Ireland to really get much more bang from our buck from this crop that's really suited to our island. The key points about uh, oats and indeed any crop is that biodiversity is important and valuing biodiversity and biodiversity nuanced for our regions. OK, so very often we lift stuff from other from neighboring islands and we apply it here. Not always a good idea. 
There are very specific microclimatic conditions where we could be doing an awful lot better by evaluating what biodiversity is most important for our region. Breeding is important, but it's a new era of breeding. Okay, so it's in low input system we're looking at now. We have, we have to make sure the varieties perform well under low inputs. Oats also contain compounds that block nutrient uptake in the human uh, gut. We want to reduce the levels of those. They're called anti-nutritionals. And we also want to develop oat varieties that promote the gut health, healthy biomes in humans, but also at the farm level. So it really has to be a systems approach from health back to the soil and from the soil through to health. We can't break them up like we used to do traditionally. We have the tools now that we don't have to do that. We can look at it in a systems approach. And I just want to give you a little bit of science uh, here and looking at the potential of crop biodiversity in breeding and looking at oats. So we did a study with Cranfield University in the UK looking at a diversity panel of oats. So every blue dot here represents a different variety of oats. OK, and what the scale here is, is toxins. So there's a fungus that attacks oats and contaminates it with a toxin. The toxin is bad for human health. So we want a low level. So a high level on this scale is bad and a low level is good. So this is what we found in the field. And we also tested the same varieties under glasshouse conditions because we always do it in a few ways. And what we found is that there are some varieties. It doesn't matter what the conditions are, field or glasshouse they always have low levels of mycotoxins. And this is very exciting for us because it really means that we should be looking at these for developing new varieties that support lower levels of toxins. Therefore, they can be used to produce safe food substances. And that links into something that Lisa might allude to later, which is the high performance, low risk crops. The focus traditionally was on yield. That's totally understandable. But as we move to lower input systems, yield will always be important, but resilience is extremely important and we have to valorize resilience, okay? Ability to produce yield under low input systems, so reducing the risk associated with the crop production. And just as I said, I would come back to microbial diversity. We work a lot on a group of microbes. These are bugs that live inside plants. They're not in the rhizosphere, they're inside the roots. They're called endophytes. I like these little fungi. They're very good. We often, I look to wild relatives of crops and say, what, what bugs have been lost in agriculture through selective breeding or through the application of chemicals? So we look at wild relatives, such as wild relatives of barley. We find bugs and then we test, are they, do they add any potential value to commercial barley? Can they improve disease resistance? Can they uh, reduce abiotic stress, drought resistance, heat resistance? And we find ones that do. And this is just one visual example. So here is some barley grown in pots under a drought condition. In this picture on the left, you have a, a drought condition with no endophyte treatment. And the only difference in the right is that the seed was coated with the endophyte before planting. So you see these really can improve abiotic stress tolerance. And we have a similar project ongoing with wheat. And again, I just want to show you a visual here. So this is the root of a wheat that has been grown in soil where we didn't apply the endophyte to the seed. And here we applied the endophyte to the seed before planting. And you see that there's a much better root establishment, very important criteria uh, for crops. Uh, and this is just the graphical. So here's the control and here's uh, 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 each bar here is a different end of it. So some work better than others. So this is ex an exciting area of research that we're developing further in UCD, but also through collaborative research uh, across the island and with US partners. At the end of the day, it's really timely now, given where we are with changing diets and given where we are with the tools available to us, to develop an all island strategy and agenda for plant innovation. And I use the word plant because I always want to use the word crop, <laughs> but plants are much more than crops. And, and often we, I think horticulture really needs a little bit more attention, but it's horticulture, tillage and forestry we're talking about here. And we really have to look at the regenerative farming systems and intercropping and rotation. 
And so towards that recently, in late autumn, we developed Plant A. Plant A has emerged as a key component of another centre that I'll talk about in a minute, where we realise there's a gap. We really need to address plants on an all-island level. So we set up a, uh, an all-island group, which involves in, uh, industry representative agencies and academics, government partners, et cetera, looking at what can we do collectively? What should our strategy be? And we're really looking at a three-pronged approach, increasing sustainability, diversifying our crop production systems, and looking at how can we get higher value products. And this links very clearly and importantly into a much larger initiative, which is called the Centre for Food Integrity, that Queen's, UCD, AFPI, NUI Galway, UCC, um, have been working on over the last year and a half or so. And I'm pleased to say recently that also has expanded to include Univers uh, University of Ulster. And really this is looking to transform the Irish food sector. And it's looking at food integrity, at looking at a food systems centre for the island of Ireland that will look at crops, track and trace, food provenance food safety, etc. So it's a really exciting initiative and I'm very pleased to work with Elizabeth on that in AFPI. So just to draw a few conclusions, there's a huge opportunity to develop crops on the island of Ireland, crops including horticulture, tillage and forestry, but we need a systemic and an all island approach. There's a, because Crops are a bit behind the curve in Ireland in terms of their exploitation and development. That's a negative. But also, you could turn around and look at it as a positive. There is an opportunity to really do it better, learning from other agri-food systems. And it must be a circular bioeconomy, where we're really looking at the usage of waste from one element of the crop production system uh, as the input material for another. And as I mentioned, we need an agreed all island agenda, and that's why we set up the Plant Innovation Hub, and that's a really important component of Food Day. I'll finish by just thanking lots of collaborators. I haven't listed everyone, but I particularly like to thank Elizabeth and Jonathan and Lisa and Afi that I worked closely with over the last couple of years, and other partners and industry partners on the island of Ireland and beyond. Thanks very much. Okay, um, thank you very much, Fiona, for that. That was a, a fantastic start to the afternoon session. Um, and I think the key areas uh, that you're covering there in terms of setting out uh, some of the challenges uh, and then really focusing in on the opportunities that there are from plant-based products, uh, I think uh, really sets up our next two speakers uh, exceptionally well. Um, and one thing I did want to say just at this stage, and is that uh, there's obviously plenty of opportunities for questions uh, and that we have a panel session after our next two speakers. So please get your questions in um, and we have a couple of other uh, guests who will, will join that panel session um, uh, at the end of the, the next two uh, talks. So once again, thank you very much, Fiona, for that. Uh, and that moves me on then to our two AFPI speakers. Um, for the afternoon. Uh, and the first one of those is Dr. Lisa Black. Uh, and Lisa has a BSc in Applied Biology from John Muir University, Liverpool, and a PhD in Soil Science from Aberdeen. In 1992, she moved to Northern Ireland to work as a postdoctoral fellow at Queen's, working in projects ranging from nitrogen cycling in grassland soils to development of resistance in cereal pathogens. In 2003, Lisa started working at the plant testing station at the AFBE Cross Nacrevi and was soon responsible for, for producing the cereal recommended list for Northern Ireland. In 2019, she became head of station at AFBE and has oversight of a range of statutory, commercial and research trials in multiple herbage and cereal species. Recent research work has focused on soil health, cover cropping and impact with key objectives to introduce innovations into variety testing and to develop methods to measure traits of sustainability and resilience in crop varieties. Lisa has wide experience sitting on several UK committees, including the National List 
and Seeds Committee, representing Northern Ireland's devolved authority, DERA. The plant testing station also provides a comprehensive range of knowledge transfer to growers, breeders, agronomists, and teaching in varieties and seeds for QUB students and fosters close working relationships with CAFRI. So with that introduction, Lisa, and the presentation you're about to deliver, the role of plants in harnessing the opportunities in food and forage production. It's over to you. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, I only have 15 minutes, so it is going to be quite brief, um, but I want to just start by looking at the challenges and opportunities that agriculture in general face. Um, we have an increasing population, um, echoing some of the things that Fiona says, we have reduced inputs, whether that's due to legislation or development of resistance by, um, for example, pathogens, weeds and pests to uh, agrochemicals. And we also have climate change. And this um, shows on, on the right hand side, um, a field at Cross Creevy last year. And then um, on the, the photo in the middle shows, shows a waterlogged field um, this winter. So we are getting real um, diverse uh, uh, weather, more extreme water events. And agriculture as a whole is increasingly being urged to reduce its dependency on external inputs while lowering its environmental footprint and coping with these climate changes at the same time. But as Fiona says, this does present opportunities and I don't want to go over the same ground as Fiona, but I think the changing diets um, that uh, society is driving through and, and the need for that um, from a sort of a sustainable perspective means that we have an opportunity to really work in harmony with the livestock sector and move towards a more integrated mixed farming um, sort of system. Fiona mentioned the word regenerative and I, I do think that's the way we need to be going in Northern Ireland. In terms of policy, um, policy is basically meant to be a system of principles to guide decisions for logical outcomes and we certainly have a lot of policy which um, supports sustainable agriculture on a global level. We have the UN sustainability goals, um, uh, there's climate action, there's life on land, there's um, good health and well-being. Um, Fiona's touched on sort of the European and, and um, uh, Irish sort of uh, policy documents and I want to just focus in on what we have in Northern Ireland. We have the Psalms report which is very much about sustainable land management and valuing soils and sort of in, in development are um, the future agricultural policy framework and also the Northern, Northern Ireland climate change bill. And these will feed very much into green growth and this is a holistic approach. Um, the minister mentioned this at the beginning of the day, and we hope to deliver sustainable outcomes for our climate, our environment, and our economy. Um, in Northern Ireland, we don't actually have a, a plant science or a crop strategy, and I see that as an opportunity now to maybe develop that, you know, in the, the current time we're in. Um, but we do have the UK plant science research strategy document and this is a green roadmap for the next 10 years and was actually launched last year after consultation with over 100 um, researchers and, and stakeholders across the UK including Northern Ireland and four big research questions were posed and what I want to do is focus on the first two given that we only have 15 minutes in total so um, the first question I've distilled down to what species where and when um, in a Northern Ireland context, you can see that the vast majority of agricultural land is grass um, and that um, most of that grass is over five years. So it could be more productive in terms um, of, um, it, you know, time since reseeding. And also it's not actually benefiting from the new varieties that are being bred um, through, through the system um, and, and evaluated for, for improved yield and quality. So I think the scope there to include um, additional crops in grassland rotations and um, like Fiona, I'm a bit of a, uh, my focus is on cereals and you can see there that wheat, barley and oats do register on this chart, which by the way, thank you to Gareth Burns for producing this from the Deerah Stats. Um, spring barley makes up about 40% of all cereal crops in Northern Ireland. This presents a real opportunity for Northern Ireland um, landscape to, to have a, a really good um, uh, way to try and protect the land and soil and also um, make more of the real sources we already have. And I want to talk specifically now about cover crops. And this is very much based on um, 
a PhD student, Paul Cotney, who did his work at Afby Cross and Creevy um, on cover crops. And um, Paul basically screened about 17 different species of cover crop to find out which species would be best suited for Northern Ireland conditions. Um, he selected five of those, took them out to the field, did a few field trials, um, making it sound quite easy. It was a massive undertaking. Um, looking at how these uh, varieties, sorry, species performed uh, in Northern Irish conditions, looking at their interaction with slurry and also looking at timing. And what Paul found that was that species choice was critical, sowing time was critical, and also that uh, if done right, um, they can really um, harness the nutrient resource that is within organic manures, specifically pig slurry in this case. And if that is done correctly, the benefits we get from cover cropping are weed suppression, greater evapotranspiration than if the ground was left fallow, which means that the ground is more trafficable. There's opportunity to, to have um, livestock foraging on that ground. It's also possible to reduce the spring barley nitrogen requirement going forward. So that means that the cover crop incorporated into the ground is providing a nutrient resource for the following crop. So that's good news for the farmers. It's good news for the environment. Um, provides addition of organic matter to the soil and also uh, we're getting better efficiency from the slurry resource that we have than if we didn't use cover crops. So that's one way, where, area where we could use species to, to, to try and help you know, um, address uh, some of the issues we have in Northern Ireland um, agriculture. Um, I would like to say that uh, in the south there is subsistence uh, sorry, a subsidy for growers using cover crops. And I think there's scope for that in Northern Ireland to encourage uptake. Another crop I'd like to touch on briefly is rye. Um, it's suitable for grain or as an urge forage crop. Agronomically, it's quite nice to, to, to manage. Um, if you can keep it standing, that's half the battle. Um, it's drought tolerant, it's very hardy, um, can withstand low temperatures and, and, and grows really early in the spring. So it really sort of romps away. Um, and in terms of um, nitrogen requirement, it's much lower than, say, winter wheat, when you're crying about 160 tonnes per hectare. In terms of end use, it's got diverse grain uses in flowers and low GI, high fibre foods, um, maybe not quite as healthy are the whiskey, beer and gin, but in moderation, they could be good for you. Um, we have uh, also a lot of evidence, particularly from Denmark, where um, winter rye use in, in um, feed grain for pig finishing actually helps maintain pig gut health and um, makes them feel fuller longer, which makes them behave better. Um, so... I think there's a huge potential there for rye in Northern Ireland, and we have uh, started evaluating this in Crossna Creevy for a, a couple of commercial um, uh, companies there. Um, the other crop I want to touch on is oats, and Fiona's done a fantastic job explaining the benefits of oats, but I really want to just touch on the Northern Ireland context in that we have um, had, for the last four years, we've been doing uh, trials with whites, focused really on agronomy and varieties, and really... Uh, providing information to, to a whole range of stakeholders, growers, breeders, agronomists, um, so that, you know, um, we, we, we have that link with industry and providing information to growers on, on how best to con manage the con their crop. Um, another way of looking at the sex of oats or the potential for oats uh, in the UK and Ireland is to look at variety submissions um, to the UK nationalist testing system. This shows the number of varieties being submitted for evaluation um, from uh, 2006 to 2021. You can see the numbers have effectively doubled. So there's a real investment from breeders in a note breeding, which is good for us. And more varieties means more opportunity effectively. Um, and this is where I want to sort of try and address the second question from the UK strategy, big questions, and that is effectively um, how to increase quality and yield with reduced chemical inputs. And this is where I want to focus in on my uh, favourite topic, which is varieties. And I think varieties really do play a key role in um, creating productive, sustainable, resilient agri-food sectors across the UK, Europe and globally. Um, what we need effectively is a variety testing systems uh, that are more efficient and that focus on traits that include sustainability and re resilience. Like Fiona said, we need to valorize resilience. That means shifting the focus from chasing highest yields available with whatever we can throw at it, um, 
no matter what the environmental costs, to a more balanced approach where we identify varieties that perform well with less. And what this needs is an innovative um, way to look at variety testing. And that is what Innovar is about now. Innovar is a EU funded project um, that we developed uh, in collaboration with UCD and 20 other partners. Um, looking at next generation variety testing, effectively what we are aiming to do is combine conventional plant science with cutting edge technologies to create a new science. And um, the technologies we're going to be using are phenomics, genomics and machine learning which Fiona has touched on already. Um, we're going to apply these to a series of, of trials across uh, the EU. These trials have been established in October, November last year um, across five agroclimatic zones. And they are using the same um, harmonized protocols to create clean harmonized data that really will make us uh, gives us the best opportunity to, to overlay these technologies to create really good data for, for looking at innovations in variety testing. Um, you can see uh, number one there is the trial at Afby Cross Nacrevi in the Maritime North um, Agroclimatic Zone. Um, I just want to focus a little bit on, on the phenomics. Um, phenomics is one of the emerging areas that Afby are hoping, well, we are developing expertise in, and the video sh effectively shows a drone, that's a Caffrey drone actually taking off and landing in um, our Innovar trial at Cross Nacrevi. And the picture on the left shows one image that this drone gathered of the 270 plots that are in that trial. Um, now, normally assessment of any traits in that trial would be done by hand and would by a very experienced eye and would take several hours to do, whereas that drone can um, capture images from the hundreds of plots in a matter of minutes. So there's huge potential in drone technology for variety evaluation from a breeding and testing perspective, um, and also for other applications in plant health um, as well. One of the more impactful um, outputs of the project, and Fiona did mention this briefly, was high performance, low risk. Um, this is one of the uh, sort of end outputs of the project, which we hope will have a lot of impact on growers across Europe. And um, it's basically a variety categorization system that will be potentially can be applied to any crop in a range of different growing scenarios. And it aims to help growers identify varieties that suit their end uses and environments, but taking the emphasis off, off yield, providing information that enables them to choose uh, varieties that perform best given their specific risks. And increasing growers, increasingly growers are focusing on, on, on yields, looking at yields, see how, how crops and varieties perform with low or minimal um, inputs. And, and the, variety, the Innovar variety trial series has treatments which um, reflect this uh, sustainability treatments as well. So HPLR aims to shift variety choice in this direction and Innovar aims to bring breeders, variety testers and growers along this journey to try and achieve a more fit for purpose variety testing and recommendation system. And this will really feed into agriculture in general if we can shift uh, the, the varieties we are producing away from the need for a serious amount of inputs and that's just, uh, addressing the sustainability agenda as well. Um, Going forward, um, I want to talk very briefly about um, how the importance of the interaction between plants, varieties and, and soil. Um, plants interact with soil um, on a, a small scale on the rhizophyll level, but also on a variety scale level. So this is um, you know, a very important consideration going forward. And I think that's very much where a lot of science is going. Fiona's alluded to the importance of a healthy soil and a healthy microbiome. And just want to touch really briefly on a couple of projects we are conducting in AFP. One is looking at developing uh, metrics for soil health. So we're looking at a range of characteristics to see how we can provide a toolkit for growers to for them to be able to evaluate the soil health and take measures to improve it based on those results. Um, the Northern Ireland livestock industry produces over 10 million tonnes of slurry a year. There are over 24,000 livestock farms with 24 million livestock and a lot of organic manures are produced from this. And there is a need to evaluate the impact of this on soil health, crop performance. And another aspect of work we're looking at is, is a field trial we established last week where we're also looking at pathogen fate. A lot of these manures contain a lot of pathogens, so we really need to get a handle on what is happening out there. And this very much feeds into um, 
the whole soil plant variety agenda as well. Finally, um, vision, um, what I would like to see um, going forward for plant science and for the role that plants play in uh, food and forage production is a diversification of landscape and a diversification of the species grown, um, improved soil health and improved environmental outcomes. I'd like to see varieties that are evaluated for resilience and sustainability taking the pressure off the need to uh, use excessive agrochemicals. And this all works and feeds into green growth. And finally, I do think there's a need for a development of plant science expertise. And I would like to see a plant science strategy for Northern Ireland or a crop strategy for Northern Ireland. And finally, I just want to say thank you to all my co-workers and collaborators. Thank you very much. OK, um, thank you very much, Lisa, for that. Uh very impressive uh, presentation. Um, I can see from the first two speakers that we're beginning to get some consistent themes here um, around the opportunity uh, opportunities that there are for plants. We also seem to have quite a, an arsenal of technology and research uh, in the area to overcome a lot of the problems uh, and challenges that we have. And there's a very consistent theme around the health, soil health right through to human health. Um, and it just got me thinking there when we discussed oats and rye. Um, there's the opportunity that if you eat enough oats, um, that in some way will, you know, will compensate for the consumption of the rye products around uh, whiskey uh, and gin and that as well. So there's an encouragement there to consume vast quantities of both. Um, so thank you very much for that, Lisa. Um, and that brings us on very nicely to our third and final speaker this afternoon, uh, and that is Dr. Jonathan Dalzell. Jonathan is Head of Grassland and Plant Science at AFPE from January 21. Prior to that, he was a Senior Lecturer and Biochemistry Program Director and Leverholm Early Career Fellow within the School of Biological Sciences at Queen's. His research spans molecular biology and bio informatic approaches to understanding how plants interact with other organisms, including parasites and microbes. His research has been funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bayer Crop Sciences, the Royal Society, Innovate UK, Invest NI and others. And the title of Jonathan's presentation this afternoon is The Opportunity Landscape for Plant Science in Northern Ireland. So over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to build on the presentations from Professor Duhin and Dr. Black by exploring some of the research that AFB will be conducting in support of agriculture, horticulture and forestry in Northern Ireland and further afield. Aspects of our research underpins important statutory obligations around plant health surveillance, as well as developing new approaches to enhance the productivity, resilience and sustainability of trees and crops. Undoubtedly, there, there is a need to expand and diversify local crop production to address shifting priorities and to capitalize on emerging opportunities, both nationally and internationally. Expanding and protecting our forests must also be a, a crucial component of our trajectory towards carbon neutrality. So over the next 10 minutes or so, I want to tell you about three projects that incorporate new technologies, techniques, and ways of thinking to enhance and protect plants. Specifically, we'll look at how beneficial microbes can be harnessed for crop and tree protection. We will consider how advanced breeding techniques like gene editing can rapidly develop defined crop traits. And finally, we'll look at how advances in DNA sequencing technology can underpin plant health surveillance uh, in support of vibrant and successful agriculture, horticulture and forestry sectors. So all plants live in partnership with a complex microbiota the microorganisms that live on, in, and around plants. And that genetic material associated with the microbiota is referred to as the microbiome. And you'll have heard a little bit about that, both from Professor Duhin and Dr. Black uh, before now. Our understanding of how the microbiome interacts with and influences plant physiology is rapidly expanding. We know that the microbiome can influence a vast array of plant traits. It can alter plant hormone production to promote growth under stifling conditions. It can improve nutrient acquisition and resource utilization. It can alter flowering time and protect from disease to name a few specific examples. Plants can also actively influence the composition of their microbiome 
by manipulating and recruiting specific microorganisms that will provide additional benefit on a needs basis. So I like to think about this kind of dynamic plant microbe interaction as a sort of genetic pick and mix. The plant has a defined catalog of genes in its genome, which encode a suite of genetic tools. And through this active and plastic collaboration between plant and microbe, the plant can access a much wider diversity of genetic tools, which allows the plant to be more agile in terms of its response to biotic or abiotic stress. Traditionally, we've approached the genetic improvement of plants in isolation of the microbiome. However, there's now a huge opportunity to redress that and take a more realistic and holistic approach to the genetic improvement of crops and trees in partnership with a tailored trait promoting microbiome. So plants are inoculated with a microbiome either vertically through transmission in and on the seed or horizontally through the soil and air. Collecting, characterizing and cataloging the plant associated microbiome is a first step towards understanding and exploiting the genetic potential that it comprises. We've now engaged with the UK Crop Microbiome Initiative and Cryobank Project, uh, which will support cutting edge research to develop our understanding of the healthy and productive plant microbiome. Ultimately, we aim to develop microbial solutions to plant trait development and disease resistance. A number of years back, my colleague, Dr. Neil Warnock and I embarked on an experiment into the possible. We aim to develop an innovative new approach to controlling the global problem of plant parasitic nematodes. These microscopic nematodes infect plant roots from the soil and are thought to reduce global crop yield by just over 12% each year. And that is a huge economic hole in the pockets of farmers all over the world. The image that you can see on screen shows the nematodes, which are stained pink, migrating inside the plant root, looking for a suitable feeding site. And our task was to engineer a soil microbe to make and release a safe plant protective product directly into the soil around the plant roots. So we viewed the microbe as a simple biological chassis, which we could fit out with a new set of genetic instructions, giving it the capacity to protect crop plants. That project was funded initially by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and then subsequently by Bayer Crop Sciences, um, taking us on a journey from Belfast to Seattle, and then on to Nairobi. So I took the picture on screen during a survey of banana and plantain farms in Kenya and Tanzania. And without exception, every farm we visited was absolutely riddled with plant parasitic nematodes. And when we spoke to the farmer in this image, he reflected on the fact that he was recording consistent drops in yield over the previous five years and put it down to issues with soil fertility. You can see one of our collaborators in Kenya, Dr. Danny Coyne, using a machete to cut out nematode infections from the banana planting material. And this simple act of cutting half of the planting material away and then cooking what was left in a pot of boiling water for 30 seconds was enough to remove or kill the nematodes and increase crop yield by over 100%. Now you'd be excused for thinking that the tools available to deal with these plant parasitic nematodes are much advanced at home. However, that simply isn't the case. Many of our most effective nematicidal products have been withdrawn from market because of health and safety issues. So we desperately need innovative new approaches to managing these pests at home and abroad. So myself and, and Neil, we engineered the, the soil microbes to synthesize and release these new plant protective products, demonstrating robust proof of principle for a new approach to crop protection. And that work was published in PLOS Pathogens, underpinning patent applications and ongoing R&D. So if you look at the figures on screen, you can see that we're essentially measuring the level of plant parasitic nematode infection and control treatments without the engineered microbes, and that's represented by the black bars, alongside experimental treatments with a variety of modified microbes indicated by the white bars. The most effective microbes could protect the plant by up to 90% relative to control. So it's a really substantial protection from these parasites. Now we may never get to the point where deploying this kind of technology is feasible in Northern Ireland, but this shows clearly, I believe, the value of microbes to agriculture. We don't necessarily need to genetically engineer the microbes or manipulate them in any way. In fact, what we're now setting out to do is identify natural microbes from plants and soils in Northern Ireland, which already contain beneficial genetic tools, which we can characterize and exploit for agricultural gain. The second project that I want to touch on briefly 
relates to the use of advanced breeding techniques like gene editing. Uh, gene editing allows us to make very precise changes to the plant DNA. Previous research demonstrated a role for the plant hormone ethylene in regulating the attraction of plant parasitic nematodes. If ethylene signaling was enhanced, the parasitic nematodes were less attracted to the plant roots. And if ethylene signaling was reduced, then those same parasites were more attracted to the plant roots. Work led by Stephen Dyer, a PhD student in my research group, identified a number of plant genes that were involved in regulating the ethylene signaling pathway. Stephen demonstrated that when those genes were turned off in the plant, that it altered the chemicals released from the plant roots into the soil, and that this change was responsible for the differences in nematode attraction to the roots. Knowing that to be the case, we were then in a position to intelligently modify crop plant traits using gene editing. So in collaboration with a number of institutes, including Queen's University Belfast, the John Innes Center, um, with funding from uh, BBSRC, uh, we were able to uh, develop a range of gene edited varieties that could recapitulate our previous results, developing a new source of resistance to these plant parasitic nematodes. Gene editing, as, as I said, is a technology that expedites the breeding process. It targets the intervention and ensures that we're developing traits that are tailored to address specific needs in a time and cost effective manner. DEFRA recently published a public consultation on the regulation of genetic technologies like gene editing with a view to altering the legislation. It's certainly my view that the proportionate and risk-based regulation of gene editing and aligned genetic technologies would allow us to rapidly generate new crop varieties that are more productive, resilient, and sustainable. If we continue to pass up on new technologies like this uh, and, and scientific innovations, we'll, we'll simply continue to lose ground and become less competitive relative to early adopters. AFPI submitted a response to that consultation in support of regulatory revision of these technologies, which could be transformative for agriculture, horticulture, and forestry in Northern Ireland. The third and final project that I want to introduce harnesses the latest technology to improve our plant health surveillance programs. Trees and crops are under increasing threat from pests and pathogens as a result of globalization, climate change and diverging trade routes and supply chains. Active surveillance allows us to identify threats and mitigate their impact in a timely and cost-effective manner. Recent advances that you'll have heard about in earlier sessions um, around DNA sequencing technology provide an opportunity to improve plant pest and pathogen surveillance using environmental DNA as a diagnostic substrate. Environmental DNA is ubiquitous, you find it everywhere, and it's specific to the organisms inhabiting a given environment, which underpins its utility for biodiversity surveillance. So we're now planning to exploit this kind of technology to protect plant health in a range of settings. Uh, we're collecting rainwater that is filtered down through the forest canopy to identify environmental DNA signatures specific to forest pathogens and pests within the water samples. We're also using environmental DNA to identify plant pathogens using honeybees as plant health sentinels. So by profiling pollen and honey, we can identify not only which plant pathogens that the bees have encountered in their travels, but by virtue of pollen analysis, we can also pinpoint which plant species are at risk of disease. And that will help us to provide an early warning system for new or expanding threats. These new approaches are made possible by um, this, this technology and hardware from Oxford Nanopore, this sequencer, you can hold it in your hand and it gives full length sequences uh, of DNA, which is uh, incredibly useful. But it's gonna help us safeguard the high plant health status of Northern Ireland, which is more important now than ever. Historically, we've relied on defined trade and import routes through Great Britain to provide early warning of plant pathogens and pests that may arrive here in Northern Ireland. Already, we're seeing a diversification of trade routes post-Brexit, post which circumvent Great Britain and may place us at higher risk of plant pathogen and pest outbreaks. We're already aware of new unregulated trading systems for honeybees that elevate the risk of pest import and establishment in Northern Ireland. And with issues around soil movement from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, we're now beginning to see planting material being sourced from higher risk countries in the EU, again, to circumvent the trade barrier between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 
Over time, it seems likely that trade routes and supply chains will continue to diverge, and that makes it all the more important that we develop and maintain a state-of-the-art plant health surveillance capability for Northern Ireland. It's also important to connect the dots between disciplines. Net carbon neutrality is high on the policy agenda right now, and a healthy plant is a carbon sequestering plant. I think we can sometimes forget that plants are a hair's breadth from being practically magic. They, they suck carbon directly out of the atmosphere and sequester a considerable amount of it underground. And so plants and trees, they must represent a substantial element of our vision for a carbon neutral society. So just to summarize very quickly, we're developing new technology, uh, adopting new technology to develop innovative approaches for plant health surveillance. We're exploiting the genetic potential of the plant microbiome alongside advanced plant breeding tools to develop specific crop traits in a time and cost-effective manner. Plant science can deliver major socioeconomic benefits across sectors in Northern Ireland, and AFPI is well placed to support the necessary transition towards a more balanced agricultural and environmental outlook for Northern Ireland. There has, however, been a, a long-term and stark disinvestment in plant science education and research in the UK and Northern Ireland. Um, so if we're to effectively address shifting environmental priorities and capitalize on, on consumer appetite for plant-based foods, we will need to invest more in plant science education and research capacity. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, um, for a really uh, informative, excellent uh, presentation. In fact, we have three excellent presentations uh, this afternoon in the third session. And I would encourage people um, to uh, put forward your questions um, now as we move into the panel session. So I'll give our three speakers uh, just a little moment or two to uh, get themselves ready for the questions. Um, and I'll introduce two additional panel members that we have this afternoon. Um, the first of those is Adrian McGowan, and Adrian is chairman of the Vegetable Committee of the Ulster Farmers Union. Uh, and our second additional panel member is James Mathers, and James is general manager at White Soap. So you're very welcome, uh, all our panel members. Um, and uh, we'll have a few minutes here of questions. Um, the first couple are really for all the all the panel, um, and then we'll maybe move to some other which are a bit more specific uh, around the talks. But the first question um, that has come in, uh, and it's set out in uh, Professor Doon's uh, talk at the start about the limited uh, acreage that we had of plants uh, across the island. What do the panel think are the barriers? Uh, why are we in that position? Um, what are the barriers to growing uh, the acreage of, of crops and how do we go about uh, leveraging that? Um, I'll maybe start with Professor Doohan. Uh, thanks, Martin. I, I think one of the barriers is that, uh, I think one of the barriers really is that uh, at one level we're creatures of habit, okay? And we do what we do and we know it. And so we really need communities. We need to change in communities of practice. I put that on the slide. I think that's really true. You know, my, my brother-in-law is a beef farmer and he always tells me he makes no money. So I said to him one day, well, why do you do it? <laughs> and he says, it's because what I, it's what I know, you know, it's what I am. So, you know, it's a part of the identity. The social sustainability is extremely important, but also that's one element, but also uh, I think that there is that we're really not, we're only beginning to look on a nuanced level at what's appropriate for our Ireland, island rather than taking from other countries. So I did my PhD, my doctorate in Cambridge and Norfolk, where the agricultural production systems are very, very different from Northern Ireland or from the Republic of Ireland. And many crop varieties emerge out of there and they're then tested in different environments across the UK but they emerge out of there. They're not, they're not emerging out of the microclimates that we face. So that's two reasons that I would put as a barrier. Thank you very much, um, Professor Doohan. Um, I'll maybe put that to James, to James Mathers um, of White Soaps. Any thoughts? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think po policy would be certainly one. I think when you've seen the sort of policy agenda over the last 20, 30 years and how it's encouraged 
um, you know, a lot of livestock production uh, on the island. So uh, I think that would be one that I, that I would uh, comment on. I think I would, I would agree with Fiona's uh, answers in terms of you know, the, the, the community and, and being creatures of habit. Um, and I think you know, having, having the research and the available research there for uh, farmers and growers that, that maybe want to change their system to a, to a plant-based system, um, you know, there, there's not a lot available um, that, that's, that's locally, locally uh, completed research for, for anyone wanting. Uh, to go down that route. So I think those are those are a couple that I would highlight. But I suppose I would also comment that um, you know economics is always plays a role. So uh, as Fiona alluded to and with her brother in law, um, you know, the new ventures have got to pay. There's certainly consumer demand out there for more plant-based foods and products. Um, but ultimately, you know, the economics of, of the system will determine whether it's successful or not. Okay, thank thank you very much, James. Um, and I'll maybe just um, ask a a farmer uh, and a grower at the at the tough end. Adrian, have you any comments around how we we grow the sector? Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm what you say a little bit long of the tooth now. I've been growing vegetables for maybe goodness forty years. <laughs> Huge change over the years from what was very much a local based uh, production system. Uh, supplying local markets and that was generally how uh, people got their veg uh, through to now uh, moving through what would have been you know like local supermarkets uh, you know the Stuarts the Duns whatever through to now the multinationals and you, from a grower's point of view you, it's, it's got quite tough to, to stay in there but the, the, the price of veg has gone down yet consumption is not rising and we're we're talking about opportunity uh, and, and maybe moving towards a more a plant-based diet and a general trend towards that. And I, I feel there, there are those who uh, engage with that and, and have that desire to look at a healthier diet. And then there are those who just don't eat veg. Uh, and and the, 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 while it may be relatively cheap, they're still not consuming. Especially in Northern Ireland, we're probably the lowest uh, consumption rate in, in, in the UK, uh, yet we've got very cheap produce. So uh, the opportunity going forward, we, we a uh, small number of growers that are there, there's, there they, we hope there's, uh, with a bit of government backing and expertise, which there is within the industry uh, at research end, uh, to try and see a way forward and maybe to, as I say, the, the lack of uh, chemicals, et cetera, uh, we're, we're, why we're not moving towards organic more. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to manage crops now with the lack of chemistry, but uh, I think that's the benefit of staying in smaller growers. Uh, large operations and in intensive ways of growing are actually quite difficult to do now too. So. Uh, Anyway, that, that's, if that's, uh, I think there's, as you say, there's opportunity. Uh, I was just trying to find our way through that to, um, to, to, to link with the growers and, and the consumer. Uh, and that's what okay. we're, we're working at. Thank, thank you very much, Adrian, for that. Um, and just finally, are, if any of our two speakers from AFBE, if Jonathan or Lisa want to make any comment before we move to the next question. I just have one very brief comment, um, you know, I think finance is a, is a big issue and potentially we do need incentives for change. So that's just my very brief comment, um, okay. particularly sort of in the area of cover crops in the south. You know, there's uh, subsidies for that and that's encouraging uptake um, okay. of, a, of a practice. Yeah. OK, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Moving on to our, our second question here. Uh, and again, uh, I'll take comments from across the panel. But I'll, I'll direct it first of all to Professor Dewan. Um, could you please comment on the suggestion often in the media that improvements or increased focus on plants and crops will dramatically change land use and possibly displace livestock farming? For example, your, your brother-in-law. Yeah, so no. It's a re we've done a really bad job if what we say comes across as displacement. They're integrated systems. 
So, you know, we need to learn from the past and have integrated farming models. So we're not displacing, we're integrating crops back into our agricultural systems to have a sort of a circular farm-based economy. So very deaf, one will benefit the other as they did in the past, but it's not displacement, it's synergy. And that would be my comment on that. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Dewan. Um, to ask maybe uh, Adrian, I'm going to go back back to you in terms of the, this question around land use um, and how do you see that potentially changing uh, in Northern Ireland if uh, we did have a wish to grow the crops and horticultural sectors to meet a market um, demand? No, Northern Ireland is, 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 as you know, is quite diverse in its soil types. Uh, it, it's it doesn't lend, it doesn't have large areas like Lincolnshire uh, of perfect soils where, where, where a patchwork of mixed of soils. Uh, and that's why I think the smaller units still work here. It's just keeping that, uh, it's, it's, it's keeping the returns in there to keep people in the production. Because to me, it, as if you, to keep the production spread and less intensive, that to me is better for the environment. It keeps a more diverse uh, cropping structure through the countryside uh, and, and trying to, to get growers to, I, I think growers can uh, contribute a huge amount environmentally. If, it, For instance, the, the, the spring barley, it, it fits in very often with vegetable growing, uh, retaining stubbles, uh, overwintering food for birds. You know, there's a, a, an integration there if we can just find a system uh, and it's, it generally comes down to returns that keep growers uh, producing. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Adrian, for that. I'm going to move on now to a question specifically for Lisa here. Uh, and within your presentation, you talked about looking at the parameters for the biological parameters for assessing soil health. Uh, would you like to expand a wee bit more on that around how you would determine what is a healthy soil? Yeah, so um, we look at a range of parameters and I suppose the ultimate one is looking at earthworm numbers. Um, if you look at earthworm numbers compared to, um, you know, fairly undisturbed soil compared to an arable soil, um, they're much lower in an arable soil, but it's a question of determining what range is suitable for that particular land use. Um, the other parameters that we're looking at are soil, micro soil microbial biomass carbon. Um, and we're pairing that with uh, doing Solvita tests, which is part of the NRM suite for looking at soil health. And what we've found is that um, the Solvita test potentially isn't um, a, a good match for our grassland soils because they're too high in organic matter. So um, that's quite interesting in itself. Um, the other parameters we're looking at are PLFA, phospholipid fatty acid, which gives you an idea of the relative um, uh, proportions of fungi and bacteria in your sort of microbial population. So um, we're near completing all those measures in with on um, uh, experimental trials and also out on field. So our aim this next year is to, to get those together to try and create limits for each land use and if somebody is above or below a linear it'll flag that, you know, potentially there are measures needed to increase um, or, or do management methods that um, increase that within the sort of accepted limit or desired limit as such. Okay. okay, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Uh, and just to make sure we haven't forgot about Jonathan, um, there's a, a couple of questions in here in your presentation, and I'll start with the first one. Um, could you expand a bit, Jonathan, on the benefits to gene editing that that could provide for farmers in Northern Ireland? Absolutely. Thanks, Martin. So, you know, the, the fantastic opportunity that gene editing represents is, is this, this potential to introduce variation directly. So as many, as many folks here will know, the, the process of, of crop breeding is long, arduous, expensive. Um, and so the ability to, to directly inject the, the variation you need at a specific point in, in the genetic toolkit of an individual um, crop plant or variety, it allows you to short circuit a very long and expensive process. Um, so the opportunity there, of course, Northern Ireland being you know, a, a small place, um, 
but but very diverse, uh, as as we've heard. The opportunity is there to allow really cost effective, time efficient um, developments that are tailored to farmers in the Northern Irish context, uh, and so that's really a, a quite a unique prospect. And uh, I mean, I firmly believe that that whether it happens this year, five years from now, ten years from now. Gene editing is, is the future of, of breeding for, for crops and animals. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Jonathan, really, really exciting uh, piece of work. Um, I do have a, a, a question for a couple of panel members, uh, and it's around crop R&D work. What new technologies can farmers use to improve efficiency or production? Um, and I'll pass that to Professor Doohan first, uh, and then to Lisa, and then to Jonathan. So I think, first of all, going back to the soil health, Martin, I think that in terms, there's a lot of biologicals coming on stream to replace chemicals, to improve nutrient use efficiency, the uptake of nutrients and the use of nutrients to improve disease resistance. It's really a new era in that, and you see all the big agrochemical companies going into that space. So that's coming on stream. And then you have Lisa, and I'm sure Lisa can say more about the phenomics and the value of that going forward, but track and trace, the digitization of agriculture, smart agriculture has a huge role to play. But I would also put in the technology, sometimes we always want the fandangle things for technology, but I would, I would put regenerative agriculture in there with technology. I think, you know, it's, it's a technology in itself that we really need to value much more just because it doesn't have sort of omics attached to it. Sometimes it's seen as not sexy, but I think actually it's really sexy going forward in terms of integrating our farm systems and you know having a much more balanced ecosystem and reducing our emissions and getting better yields. So I would stick that in there too. Okay, thank you, Professor Dune. Uh, Lisa? Any questions? Yes, certainly in the sort of arena of remote sensing, I think there's huge potential there for growers to um, use that to monitor crops, um, to have um, potential systems that can identify if intervention is needed. Um, and that definitely is a developing area. Um, there's potential also to have um, static um pieces of equipment that can monitor, for example, um, crop growth or development of disease. Um, it could be look, looking at grass growth as well. Um, and I actually think <laughs> um, really utilising varieties is one of the things we can do that is real time development of technology going forward. You know, we're evaluating new varieties every year. And actually looking towards those is a way of harnessing all the new technologies that are being brought into to, to that sort of um, uh, area of agriculture, which is developing new plants for fit for purpose. OK, thank you, Lisa. And, and Jonathan? Yeah, well, Martin, I think you've mined out most of the expertise in this room already. Um, right, okay. but, but just to add, yeah, just, just to add very briefly, um, I, I think that there are, are big opportunities for um, precision agriculture approaches, even in a small country like Northern Ireland, we have considerable soil uh, diversity and the microbial biodiversity in there will also be, be really quite large. So I, I can see a future whereby we are testing our soils, not just for you know chemical and physical parameters, but also biological parameters that can tell us about which varieties are best suited for particular soils. I think that's a, an exciting area that, that we're looking to get into as well. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. And maybe just to bring James back in. Um, James, the oats story um, at White's has been a phenomenally successful story um, that has been built over a period of time. Um, have you any lessons learnt within that that you would wish to share in terms of the opportunities to grow other crops to meet market demands? Um, well, I think, I think there's... One thing that underpins the sort of recent success, if you like, of oats is, is that, you know, it's been grown on the island of Ireland for a very long time. Uh, and it's a very well-known uh, crop and product to consumers already. Um, I think there, are, there aren't that many others, maybe, maybe some of the crops that Adrian grows that, that again, consumers will already be very familiar with. Um, so, so therein, you know, lies one of the, the, the sort of pillars of, of recent success. The other is it's also well known from a health 
uh, perspective, and again, I imagine a lot of Adrian's crops would, would be the same. Um, but whenever you look at, at bringing in, you know, entirely new uh, plant-based crops, whether those are arable crops, I mean, there's not a lot of rye grown here, but rye was mentioned earlier as an example. Uh, there, there are potentially other plants um, that, that could be looked at. I think you've got to look at uh, something Fiona referenced, which was, you know, do they grow in our climate well? Uh, what is suited to our climate? What is suited to our soil type? There, there's no point in us trying to endeavour to grow a crop that's just not suited for either our climate or soil type. I think you've also got to look at uh, nutrition, which was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we, we've got to look at if, if there is a slight tilt towards a flexitarian diet, you know, we've got to look at why that is. Um, it's largely around uh, climate and sustainability and then health. Um, people realizing that, you know, there, there's, a, there's a fine balance, that, that there's a healthy uh, an amount of, of meat to consume uh, and a plant-based diet uh, is seen as very healthy. Uh, also, and I think that you know, there's no point in us growing uh, a certain type of plant or or or, uh, or cereal crop just because we can, if it doesn't have you know a consumer acceptability or uh, a nutritional uh, element to it. Okay, thank, thanks, James. That was uh, a couple of really excellent points there um, brought out on that. Um, I'm going to move on to an, a topic that uh, we talk about every day in Northern Ireland: the weather. And I think you sort of alluded to it there about growing the right crops within Northern Ireland. So to our uh, speakers, uh, in terms of the focus on being able to grow crops that will meet the vagaries of the Northern Ireland weather, um, what uh, research and development work is ongoing uh, to do that? And I'll maybe throw that over to Lisa first. You may want to talk a wee bit about variety testing. Um, and then I'll come to Professor Doon. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think one of the key characteristics in cereals, particularly, is uh, ripe, uh, maturity and ripening and, and being able to harvest crops in a timely way. Um, so, for example, if we look at spring barley, a lot of the varieties were being bred to have later and later ripening because effectively what that did was the crop was in the ground for longer and it produced more yield. So I think what we can do is, like we're trying to do in Innovar, is actually say pull back from, you know, yield is, is the only key measure that we need. Sustainability is also about being able to harvest a crop. So having crops that harvest earlier, um, whether it be varieties or even species, is, is probably a good way forward because increasingly it's getting more difficult to harvest in, in autumns. Okay, thank you. And to Professor Dillon? Yeah, I think in, in, in the South, in the Republic, so it's the same issues as Lisa's raised, but also looking, so, you know, we have a few projects being developed and some submitted, looking at the nuances, you know, so what applies down in Wexford doesn't necessarily apply in Donegal. We really need to pay much more attention to the microclimatic conditions, in, which are very diverse across Northern Ireland. And it's, it's certainly very diverse in the Republic of Ireland. And we need to sort of adapt to that. There's quite a lot of work ongoing on biologicals and developing tests to assess soil health and, and soil fertility, biological fertility. But, and, and slightly deviating, but I really want to bring it up. One of the things we've been doing in the South is doing a survey of SMEs who are really uh, developing to meet the needs of the flexitarian market, and the plant-based products. And that informs the research that we need and on the island of Ireland. Now, I know it's a Southern, uh, Southern survey, but I think many of the things are applicable north of the border. And what it tells us is that these companies are crying out for indigenous products. They see track and trace, they see food provenance as major obstacles down the line because they are importing materials where they are, really don't have track and trace based systems uh, in place for them. So, you know, I think that we, there's a research gap there, particularly around legumes and particularly in incorporating the horticulture into some of those products. And we really need to get in there quite quickly. These companies are now developing, developing their products and we need to get in early on and to work with them to promote indigenous raw materials and to use indigenous raw material, horticultural and tillage raw materials. 
Okay, thank you very much, Professor Dewan. And I'm going to move now just to the last uh, question uh, and bring Jonathan in. Um, let's come through. What are your thoughts on breeding grass crops in partnership with livestock breeding rather than separately? For example, grass protein concentration and types of protein may not match animal needs leading to inefficiency. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, you know, there, it's it's important that we're, we're breeding grass that is, you know, um, fit for purpose. And, you know, one of the things that we produce to very high quality here in Northern Ireland, I won't need to tell anyone about this, is is, is good quality beef and, and dairy products. So it is important that we're, we're breeding for the right kind of traits. Uh, and that that's a part of our thinking. But, in, but increasingly, it, it's worth pointing out that, you know, as poli the policy agenda shifts towards, you know, carbon neutrality um, to environmental factors that, that we can't lose sight of the fact that really we need plants to fill a lot of different gaps um, in, in our ecosystems, uh, both for, for productivity, but also for the ecosystem services that they, they provide. So it's, it's not as simple as, as pointing at one direction or the other. It kind of needs to do uh, a number of different things at the same time. So carbon sequestration, um, interaction with other organisms, um, biodiversity, these are all important factors. So finding the right balance is a challenge, but that's something that we, um, that we brood over daily in AFPI. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. I think we'll, we'll finish on, on, on that. Um, just at this stage, I want to thank all the, the three speakers, um, uh, Professor Doohan, Dr. Black and Dr. Zazel. And I want to thank our other two panel members, Adrian McGowan and James Mathers, for what was a very... Uh, there were a lot of questions coming through, a lot of issues, and I thought it was a really interesting session with uh, loads of potential. Uh, to drive this area of work forward over the next number of years. So from that, Elizabeth, I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Martin. And I am impressed that I've got a plant scientist brooding in, in the chicken world. So well done, Jonathan. <laughs> I've brought you across. <laughs> but uh, all joking aside, you know, plants, I think, play a really, really important role in Northern Ireland in harmony with our livestock industry going forward. And indeed, plants were recently described to me as being the poor relations in agriculture, perhaps due to the fact they're silent and they're immobile. And, you know, it did get me thinking that that, that probably was a key reason why we don't take them seriously or as seriously as what we should. And that's why they've got a platform here today. And as I say, very much it, to work in harmony in that regenerative agricultural mode going forward. They could be a big part of the solution, both locally, nationally and internationally. So, Martin, thank you very much for, for your expert chairmanship today. Now, don't be going home and indulging in whiskey and gin and then trying to soak <laughs> it up with oats. You know, James, you've got a market here. <laughs> but uh, thank you very, very much for, for your you, input Elizabeth. today. Much appreciated. Fiona, Lisa and Jonathan, thank you for your brilliant presentations. Really excellent and stimulating. And James and Adrian, thank you for being very willing participants um, and sharing with your, us your knowledge and expertise on the panel this afternoon. Very much appreciated that you gave us your time this afternoon. So look, folks, that, that actually brings us to the, the end of session three in our conference and indeed uh, you know, concludes the, the conference as a whole. And just very briefly, I'm going to recap on, on some of the key points that came out of today through the various sessions. At the start of the day, you know, we had a ministerial address and a big focus for our minister and agriculture and the Department of Agriculture and Environment Rural Affairs going forward is that of green growth. And in, in my language, the interpretation of green growth is around growing the economy in a green way. So it, it brings in the people, the profit and the planet. How do we actually optimise our environment, our economy and societal health all in the, same, in the same space at the one time? And that's a huge challenge. And I think that's a key thread that ran throughout the whole day through the three scientific sessions. So the first session this morning, which aligns largely with our agenda of protecting animal, plant and human health, focused on the interactions between animal and human health. And indeed, you know, over the past year with the COVID-19 pandemic, this has really come to the fore. But we had uh, excellent presentations from Miles Carroll of Public Health England and from our own David McCleary and, and Ken Lemon. And well, that was accompanied by Perpetua McNamee, of the, chief, the Chief Vet in DERA and Maria Jennings, Director of FSA. 
And just what we got from those folk was, you know, there's a lot of threats out there, but thankfully through big initiatives, the likes of the Global Virome Project and CEPI, there's lots of very strong surveillance um, processes in place that are co continually improving as well. But we did learn that with regards to what keeps these folk awake at night, for Perpetua, it's tick-borne diseases. For Maria, it's the whole AMR study, uh, you know, space. And, and in fact, you know, it probably would have been higher up the agenda had COVID not happened this year. For David, it, it's listeria, um, closely followed by the likes of Campylobacter. And for Ken, it, it's the fact that avian flu may only be a few mutations at times away from jumping into the to the human population, as well as ask African swine fever and just how close it is getting to us as it moves across the, the Europe. So moving on then to the second session that we had this uh, just after lunch, and that was very much aligned with AFPI's theme of enhancing our natural and marine environment. And in that session, we took a very deep dive into modelling and managing our ecosystems to drive sustainability. So we had Professor Yao Ferrara um, from Longline, who gave us a, an overview of those interactions between the soil and the sea and how you know, that modelling and aquaculture industry in our locks and coasts actually supports a lot of upstream activities on farms. Dr Heather Moore and, and Dr Don Hadoudi then from AFB went into further depth on some of the modelling around nutrient efficiency and nutrient flows from the farm into our waterways and, and out to the coast. And I think we're, we're all, you know, we don't need to be convinced now that, you know, the fact that data and strong data analysis and modelling will be a key driver of how we manage sustainability going forward. And, and there's a lot of you know, frameworks there which we could, could be learned from and brought through into the green growth agenda and, and the framework of how we, we model our, our business of Northern Ireland agriculture going forward. Then the session this afternoon um, that we've just come from, very much focused on plants and and plants and, and the role of plant production in our food system. And as we've said a couple of times now, this is not to displace livestock farming, but very much to work together in harmony with livestock farming and bring forward those regenerative approaches for farming. And, and again, talks back to the green growth agenda. Fiona reminded us of the fact that sustainability is people, profit and planet in, in a holistic manner. And Lisa identified a range of species, you know, from their work and indeed varietal testing and how it needs to shift from just a yield perspective more through to a sustainability agenda of actually driving improved environmental health outcomes as much as yield going forward. And that will be a mind shift change that industry, policy makers and uh, wider farmers will, will have to make in the years ahead. And then Johnny concluded um, and, and brought us through a, a range of very novel techniques that will that, that's ahead of us. And, and some of those, a lot of those techniques will be very nature based um, because of the, the challenges that chemical based solutions bring. But he also outlined the fact that gene editing, it, it may be here next year, five years or 10 years, but I think we all would agree as a scientific community that it is on its way. And as such, we need to be ready for it. We need to be ready to harness the benefits that it can bring very quickly. Jonathan and Miles actually both outlined the power of nanopore technology to improve surveillance methods and design interventions for, for both animal, plant and human health. So folks, that, that really wrapped up that third session, which you know, was, was one focus on our work in the area of leading improvements in the agri-food industry. So in closing, I'd just like to thank all our speakers today, all our chairs. It was great to have the company of partners and, and colleagues throughout the day um, and, and everybody for joining. And indeed, if you missed any of the sessions earlier, there will be, this will all be on YouTube and um, we will send out links after the conference for folk to catch up on any of the earlier sessions that you missed. But I know I've had a great day and I said earlier, um, this, the conference is very much complemented by our Science Impacts booklet. So please do have a look at that and that will give you another flavour for, for other work that's ongoing in AFBI. But for me, it just remains for me to say thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.